Well, that was in 1D. What about in 2D? Because you know what we're working towards here is, you know, remember we're, we're working towards a constitutive model, the closure relationship between stress and strain. Well, we know our stress is a tensor, right? It's got nine components. So just our 1D relationship's not quite going to work. We need something that relates the nine components of stress to what we'll see is ultimately nine components of strain. And then, of course, the strain needs to be related to displacements in somehow so that we can solve our equilibrium equation. So let's look at it in 2D. In 2D, and the first thing we'll look at is, is going to be, again, epsilon x, so the strain in the x direction. And we'll just use our regular old engineering definition again, right? So if I have, if this is the reference configuration, this is sort of the undeformed configuration. Right? So this is the reference. And this is the deform. So in other words, I start with a cube or, or square, and I apply some forces to it, and it translates and deforms into this into this shape. Okay. But if you notice that we have a bunch of little differentials here, so this is really a differential element dx. This length is dx. It's small. And our change is going to be small, right? so that these sort of derivatives you know, hold. They're small changes. Okay. So, let's, but let's use our same sort of engineering definition, right? So, we have, if we look at, you know, we want to look at the change in the line segments here. So, in the under, in the deformed configuration, we have. The magnitude, the, the you know the current, the the current length, is the magnitude of the line segment AB. The original length is the magnitude of the line segment AB, and we're going to divide that by that. I'm sorry. We're going to divide it. That would be the not the correct definition of strain. Right? We want right, A B, right? So we want final length minus original length divided by original length. Okay? But our stretch is not just one dimensional, right? So we we stretched it, but it's a sort of a two-dimensional thing now. Right? So AB, if you can't read it, that's dx. Right? So we can just go ahead and make that substitution. So we have AB minus dx over dx is equal to AB over dx minus 1. Okay. Or if we solve this equation for AB, right? So let's solve for the magnitude AB. Then we have epsilon x plus one dx. All right. So the magnitude AB, right? AB is just a vector. I'm just using the points to define it, right? A, B is just a vector. It's the vector between the points A and B. And the, the vertical lines indicate that the, it's the magnitude. Right? So the magnitude of a vector is the sum of the squares of the components, right? So it would be like A, B, X squared plus A, B, Y squared. Right? So a, B in the x direction is equal to essentially B, the point B, the x component of B minus the x component of A. Okay? So what is B? B is this point, 
And, and my, reference, my reference position is sort of over here at, at big A, right? So, so we have this, so to get to B, we have this distance, which is U of X, right? This distance, which is U of X, plus the original length, DX, right? So plus DX, plus this distance here, which is defined right here as partial ux, partial x, dx. Right? And then the point a of x is just this distance here, so it's minus ux. Right? So then the u's cancel, and we're just left with this right there. Okay? So likewise, we'll do the same thing, a, b, y. So a, b is just this that th this distance, but I want to know that it's ch I want to know it, this y component. Okay. So that's just b y minus a y, which is equal to u y plus partial u y partial x dx minus u y. U y's cancel. And so now, now I have a b, I have a b x and a b y. So I want to take, let's use a different color. I want to take this guy and substitute it there, and this guy and substitute it there, right? And also, I don't like this square root, right? So in order to get rid of that square root, I'm going to square both sides of the equation. Okay. So I just said, now I say the magnitude of AB squared is equal to just what's under the radical. And so I'll go down, I'll move down here. I say AB squared, and I'm just going to plug in, right? So then I just have DX plus partial UX partial X DX squared plus partial u y partial x dx squared. And if you work it out, that evaluates to 1 plus 2 partial u x partial x plus partial u x partial x squared plus partial u y partial x squared. Okay. So now, remember I said every I said the deformation is small. So I need to give you a let's give let's give you a firm definition of what small means. Okay. So in, for our purposes, small implies that any gradient of u, the magnitude of any gradient of u is much, much less than 1. Right? So if the, you know, this is essentially a, a gradient of u, right? the, gra the gradient of ux with respect to x. So since any gradient of u is going to be small, then these, you know, I have a number that's really small, much less than 1 squared. It's going to be a really tiny number. Same here. So with that, I'm going to ignore these higher order terms. They're going to go to zero. Right? So now I have an expression for AB squared. That's 1 plus 2 partial U of X partial X. Right? So then let's return, to the, let's return up here and look at this equation. Right? So now I have something, I have al almost I have something to put on the left side for AB. Right? Ultimately, I'm trying to get a relationship between the strain, epsilon x, and the displacement. Right? So I'm getting closer. So if I just square both sides of that equation, then I have AB squared on the left-hand side, and I can substitute that in. Right? So 
I'm going to square both sides of that equation up here. And then I'll go over here and complete the work. Uh, so then, um, you know, I have AB squared is equal to epsilon squared plus 2 epsilon x plus 1. Okay. And that, according to this, is equal to 1 plus 2 partial u x partial x. So we're almost there. This is one other higher order term. So we're going to ignore it. And now, you know, you can see that the ones cancel, the twos cancel, and I have that epsilon x equals partial u x partial x. So all of that just to get the same result we had in 1D, sort of. What happened to that guy? Well, let's just work it out. What did happen to it? So I'm going back to here. The first term, it doesn't matter. Right? So I'd have So the first term is going to be like this thing squared. I don't care about that. That's going to go away. But then I'm going to have 2 epsilon x dx. And the dx squared I don't care about. Ah. Okay. It should be there. It should be there. It should be here. But also it should be there. It should be a dx there also. Dx there, right? So then days just cancel. Right? Sorry. Uh, I'm going to spare you the details, but we can work through, I mean, the whole point of going through all of that, just really just to say it's, I know it's sort of messy, but it's really just geometry, right? It's just geometry com combined with this assumption of small. So then we could do the same exact thing for epsilon y. And we can part to get partial u y, partial y. OK. 
good. So, so that gives us, you know, epsilon x, epsilon y. This is only two dimensional drawing here, but if it had a third dimension, we could follow the same arguments and get epsilon z. But now we have these shear strains, right? The, the, off, the, the, the off diagonal terms, epsilon xy, epsilon xz, and those guys, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to call this angle right here 2 epsilon xy. And the 2 will be apparent in a second, okay? But, and, and so this is, this is an alpha there, and, and that's a minus beta, if you can't see. So then 2 epsilon xy is equal to alpha minus beta, okay? And alpha, just from geometry, right, the opposite over, right, you know, the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent, right? The, the opposite, so I'm going to take the tangent of alpha. That's the opposite over the adjacent, right? So the tangent is partial u y partial x dx, that's opposite, that's, that's this guy, over the adjacent, which is dx plus partial ux partial x dx, okay? Now, again, on this assumption of small, turns out we can say for small alpha, that implies that the tangent of alpha is approximately equivalent to alpha. So then that just implies that alpha is equal to what's inside there. And I'll simplify it a little bit. But what's inside there is just uy partial x over 1 plus partial u. x partial x. So all I did was simplify the numerator. Right? I just simplified it, and then I said, okay, for small alpha, then the tangent of alpha is alpha. So alpha is equal to this. Right? Now, remember our definition of small is that the gradient of u is much, much less than one. So I have one plus something that's much, much less than one. That's approximately one. Right? So we're going to say that this is approximately one, and, there, and then therefore alpha is partial u y partial x. And then you can make likewise for beta you would get that my beta is equal to minus u of x partial y. And so then just plugging in alpha and beta back into this equation, you get that 2xy is equal to partial ux partial y plus partial uy partial x, or epsilon xy is equal to 1 half u x y plus u y x. Okay, so I know that the two there is just a curiosity or a convention at this moment, but it, it'll be real clear in just a second why we put that two right. We we just ha we just chose to call that two x y for now. Two, two epsilon x y. Okay, but then then we get this expression, and the reason for the two is that so we could go on 
and you know basically work through the geometry of all of them. <coughs> and ultimately, we could, you know, if we had a thir third dimension, we could find all the components. And here I've got it written in terms of ones and twos and threes, but you could just make the analogy that you know one is x and two is y and three is z. It's just a little more general if you write it like this because you could use a all the equations would still hold in polar coordinates where one would be r, two would be theta, and three would be an, you know, another angle. Okay, so uh, so then this this is sort of the reason for that convention of the two. And that is because ultimately we can write the entire strain tensor in, with this one compact equation for i equals 1, 2, 3, j equals 1, 2, 3. So if you sub, you know, choose an i, 1, plug it in, choose a j, 1, and let's do that real quick. We're almost done. But if we just choose, say, epsilon 1, 1, then you'll see that this is 1 half partial u 1 partial x1 x one plus partial u1 partial x1, or 1 half 2, 2 partial u1 partial x1. And the 2's cancel, and so then you just get partial u1 partial x1. Or in xy, that, you know, to follow the convention we were using, partial ux partial x, right? And you can verify that 2, 2 would give you the same thing. 1, 2 would give you partial u1, partial x2, partial u2, partial x1. Or as we were using earlier, ux partial y, uy partial x. OK? So now we know geometrically what strain is. And next time, we'll talk about the relationship between strain and stress.